you've decided to visit with us to see what we're about or just maybe you're traveling and you're passing through and you've decided to be with us, thank you for being here and we hope that you feel welcome here. This is a place that you should feel welcome and we hope that you do. I want to do a few things as we begin. The first is to fill out an attendance card, especially if you are visiting. That just helps us have a record of you being here with us, and that allows us to maybe send you a card thanking you for being with us. Uh, so if you could fill that out, and the way that you could give that to us is when the collection plate passes between the aisles, you can drop that card in that collection plate. Another thing that we would ask you to do as we worship God this morning is to silence your cell phone. Most, if not everyone here, has one, and if one goes off, that sound, that small sound, can just disrupt our worship, and we would appreciate you doing that. I want to just list our sick to remember in our prayer. The, the list this week is a little bit lengthier than usual. Of course, we have some that... Um, we have a lengthy list in general, but we have some new ones that uh, have popped up within the last couple of, of weeks. Jill Nash will have a heart procedure this month. Linda Howell is having blood pressure issues. Gene Johnson, uh, and I'm going based on the bulletin, so if any of this has changed, I haven't heard, uh, is home with pneumonia. Doris Buckner, uh, the bulletin says that she's having heart issues and I talked to her this week, and I found out, and she didn't say I couldn't say this, so, um, but I found out that she used some Raid, I think, ant spray around her house, and it got into her, her system, into her lungs. She breathed it in, and it, I guess, basically poisoned her in a way where she couldn't eat any food for uh, about a week or so without any kind of symptoms. Um, and so that was really hard on her system, and that was one of the issues that she's been struggling with lately. And so please remember uh, Miss Doris Buckner in your prayers. Give her a phone call, go visit her, send her a card, as well as all these on the list. David Nash has shingles and a urinary tract infection on top of everything else that he struggles with as far as his health. Uh, Lucille Ammon is not feeling well, and Ray Russell fell this week. He was on a ladder and fell and, and broke his ankle, had a surgery procedure to get things, uh, I guess, put back in place, and is in the hospital still, I think, hasn't gone home yet. And so we're praying that he has a speedy recovery and that all is well with him. And uh, that's all that, that's new. Of course, there's many more in the bulletin to pray for. But let me, let me announce this as we're all together. There is a prayer app called Echo. E-C-H-O, Echo. It's a prayer app. If you download that app, there is a Fayetteville group. Basically what that means is I can add you to that group and you can see anybody that posts a prayer in that group. I can post a prayer. If you're in the group, you can post a prayer and you can see that prayer, and you can do reminders where it will pop up on your phone and say, pray for Doris Buckner, pray for David Nash. It will remind you to pray for whatever prayers are in that group. And so I just want to suggest that as a way to pray for our members or whatever is going on here at Fayetteville. And if you want to be added to that group, let me know. I need your email address, and you need to download that app. And that's a great way just to be reminded of people that are of this congregation that we need to pray for on a regular basis. As we begin this morning, we'll have more announcements at the close of our worship as far as events. But as we begin, the first song will be 438, if you want to use the, the hymnals on the back of the pew, 400. And 38. Coney Johnson will be our song leader this morning. There'll be a scripture reading read by Reggie this morning from John chapter 12. John chapter 12, if you want to turn there in your Bible, leave it open in your lap. It'll serve as a text for Dave's lesson this morning. We'll begin as Reggie reads us uh, from John 12. morning. John chapter 12, verses 3 through 6. I'll be reading from the King James Version. Then took Mary a pound of ointment, a spinknard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor 
of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, Why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Four hundred and thirty eight. <clears throat> My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I cannot trust the sweetest strain, but only in the name of Jesus' name. On Christ the solid, Christ and all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. bow with me, please. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we 
thank you for this Lord's Day, and we thank you for each and every opportunity that we have to gather here to study thy word and to worship thee. And Lord, as we progress throughout this worship, we ask that everything that we say and do be well-pleasing and acceptable unto thee. And Lord, we also ask that we have open hearts and open minds, that we can take what we learn here today and apply it to our lives. And Lord, at this time, we ask a special blessing be upon all those who couldn't be with us here today, Lord. If it be for medical reasons, we ask that you be with them and those who are caring for them. And Lord, if it be for traveling reasons during this time of year, we ask that you be with them and that they are able to get to their destination safely. And Lord, we, at this time, we ask a special blessing be upon uh, Jill Nash, Jean Johnson, Doris Buckner, David Nash, and Lord Ray Russell, and all those who are listed in our bulletin. Lord, we ask that you are with them and those who are caring for them. And Lord, at this time, we also ask a special blessing be upon all those in this country who are in leadership, whether it be elected positions or appointed positions, Lord, as, as they continue to make decisions and, and do things for our country, our state, our city, we ask that they will be provided with the wisdom to make right decisions. And Lord, we also ask that you be with our elders of this congregation, that, that you be with them as they work with this congregation here, and that they will continually seek wisdom from thy word. And Lord, we also ask that you be with Dave and David as they bring the bring your word to us that they will have ready recollection of those things that they've studied. And Lord, we just, we thank you so much for your son who you sent to this earth. Lord, please forgive us of our sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. been set aside to commemorate our Savior's life and his death and resurrection. Be reading from starting in the book of Leviticus, the 17th chapter. The first verse says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, 
speaking to Aaron and to his sons and to all the children of Israel and saying to them, this is the thing which the Lord hath commanded, saying. And he goes on down, and he keeps talking about things that they must do and mustn't do. Picking up in verse 11, he says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for your souls. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, no soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. And whatsoever man there be of the children of Israel or the stranger that sojourn among you, which hunteth or catcheth any beast or fowl that may be eaten, he shall even pour out the blood thereof and cover it with dust. For it is the life of all flesh, the blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, You shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth it <clears throat> shall be cut off. Now imagine Jesus in John 6, before he's crucified, Telling the Jews, the children of Israel, John 6, picking up in verse 53, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whosoever eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. The men will come forward. Let us pray. Almighty God and Father who are in heaven, truly how great a love you have for man and for your creation in that you sent your only begotten Son to live amongst men, to die as you prepared a body for him to dwell in and live here on earth, a, a body without spot, without blemish, in him was no sin or no guile, Father. And as we partake of this bread, may our minds go back to the cross and to that body that was prepared for that sacrifice, for that purpose. Heavenly Father, as we partake of this bread, may we take it worthily in understanding that it was the sacrifice of his body for us. And all things thy will be done in Christ's name. Amen.
Father, we come to you at this time in the remembrance of that precious blood, the blood of your only begotten Son, the blood that gives life to that body that you prepared, the blood that gives us spiritual life through the sacrifice and the shedding of that blood, Father. May we partake of this fruit of the vine, which is through faith is that blood that was shed on that cruel cross of Calvary, that we might have hope, Father, and look to his coming again, Father, only through his blood, for life truly is in the blood. Heavenly Father, help us. In all things that I will be done, in Christ's name, amen. Separate from the Lord's Supper, we find this a convenient time to give as we have been prospered. Will you bow with me, please? Almighty God, we come to you with thanksgiving in our heart, being thankful for life, for our health, for the abilities to earn, make money. Heavenly Father, we ask you at this time to be with us as we give back Heavenly Father, help our hearts to be right in our minds and help us to give willingly and cheerfully. Heavenly Father, help us to realize that you gave your best and your all, Father, and help us to give accordingly in all things thy will be done. In Christ's name, amen.
Let's try that again. It's good to see you this morning. Good to be with you. You ever closed your ears and closed your heart to something that the Bible says because you don't like what God says on that subject? It would be tough for any of us in some ways to admit that that's what we've done. We don't like to think about that. Would you tell somebody who objects to what the Bible says about morality, maybe about homosexual practices, Would you tell them what the Bible says? Or would you would you tell someone who objects to what the Bible says about lying what the truth of the matter is? Or someone who objects to being completely honest? Would you tell them that's what they really ought to do? What about somebody that wants to wants to argue. Have you ever met somebody that just wants to argue with what the Bible says about things like repentance or the necessity of being baptized into Christ or whether or not the church even matters? What would you tell that person? There are folks who close their ears to what the Bible says on subjects like that. And just as there are folks who close their ears and their hearts to what the Bible says about those sorts of subjects, Folks, there are Christians, there are Christians who close their ears to what the Bible says about how we ought to use the blessings God has given us. They close their ears to what the Bible has said about giving. Friends, our words and our attitudes reveal our real character in these things. The attitudes that we have on this subject, our attitudes here really matter. Because if I have the wrong attitude, the Bible's truth is not going to be understood or appreciated or applied properly as long as I hold on to that attitude. If I have an attitude that says, I don't care what God's word says, I think what I think and that's all that matters, there's no way I'm going to do what the Bible instructs me to do. What would many of us say if we actually told the truth about how we personally give to God I want you to think about that I want you to hold on to that thought what would we say if we told the truth it's crucially important for us not just to have but to display a biblical attitude one that mirrors what God's word says that matches God's attitude if you will on this particular subject If you look at the incident that's recorded in Mark chapter 12, verses 41 and 42, where Jesus was watching, you know, watching what people put into the temple treasury in the temple in Jerusalem, you see there Jesus sat across, opposite from the treasury, from the place that they made their offerings. And he saw how the people put money into the treasury, and many who were rich put in much. Jesus saw how much they were giving. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrants. Now, we don't pay much attention most of the time to ancient coinage, but a denarius was about a day's wage. And a quadrants was about a quarter 
of a denarius. So it's about three hours worth of wages. And two mites were just a portion of that. So all this woman had was just what we would consider a little pocket change. That's all she had in the world. And that's what she gave. But the thing I want you to see here is not what she did. The thing I want you to see here is what he did. What Jesus was doing. He was watching. He was paying attention to how much the different people were putting into the offering in the temple. Now ask yourself, would I give at all if how much I was giving was going to be a matter of public knowledge? If everybody here could see how much I gave, would I even give? Would it be any different than what I do now if the amount was known to everybody? Jesus was watching, and he was paying attention to the amount, among other things. What I'd like for you to do with me this morning is pay attention to six separate attitudes that we can see in the Bible Six things that we can see in the Bible. Six attitudes on the same subject. Attitudes that we might share. Denny, I apologize. I realize now that the resolution on this is for a wide screen and not for a square screen. I hope it's all up there. Six attitudes that we might share when it comes to what we offer to our God. Some of us may have the attitude of the rich young ruler you remember him? This is the young man who came to Jesus and asked of him in Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 22, uh, what must I do to have eternal life? He didn't like what Jesus said. As he was going out on the road, one came running and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? That's verse 17. So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments. And he gives some examples. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. The young man answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell what you have, give to the poor, and come, you shall have treasure in heaven. Come, take up the cross, and follow me. But he was sad at this word and went away sad, went away sorrowful, filled with sorrow. For he had great possessions. What do we learn about this man's life? Think about this young man. He wanted to go to heaven. He wanted to go to heaven. Look at verse 17. What should I do to inherit eternal life? In the way he's thinking, everything he knows to do, he's done. He's kept the commandments. He's lived an upright life moral life he's focused on keeping the commandments verse 20 he acknowledged Jesus as a as a teacher he thought he was ready to follow Jesus to be a disciple you know there are some scholars who even go so far as to say that when Jesus said come and be my disciple they suggest that Jesus wasn't just saying come come be a follower they they would say Jesus was actually offering for him to be part of the 12, part of the inner circle, to be an apostle ultimately. I don't know if that's true or not. But the young man himself thought he was ready to follow Jesus. He was wealthy in worldly goods. He had a lot of stuff, according to verse 22. But apparently, it never crossed his mind. 
that that might be what could keep him out of heaven. That wasn't the, the way of thinking of the world. That wasn't the way of thinking of the, the Jewish community that he was a part of, that, that material wealth could actually be a hindrance to everlasting life. They kind of approached things that, that the more you had, the more God was blessing you, and the more God blessed you with stuff. Well, that, that was just evidence that you were doing something right as far as God was concerned. That was their perspective. Never occurred to him that that might be something that would keep him out of heaven, but materialism, stuffism, that's a sneaky sin, isn't it? Because we can get so accustomed to being comfortable, so accustomed to having what we want that we don't even see it anymore. We just take for granted that we can have what we want when we want it. A drunk sometimes can admit that he's a drunk. It doesn't dry him out, but he, he's a drunk and he knows he's a drunk. And a liar sometimes can admit that he doesn't always tell the truth. It doesn't stop him from continuing to lie, but, but sometimes he can own his lying. And a thief, a thief sometimes will own his dishonesty and say, when I see an opportunity, I'm going to take it, literally. Literally. But who among us can be honest enough to say, you know what, I'm greedy. I'm greedy and I want more stuff. This man seems to have had the attitude, well, is there anything that I could possibly have overlooked? No, of course not. I've done everything right since I was a child. That's, that's his mindset. What do I lack? Well, why did Jesus then tell him, sell what you have and give it to the poor and come be my disciple? Because he knew. He knew the young man had the wrong attitude about his possessions. His attitude of materialism was what was going to keep him from enjoying eternal life. He had a great life here but he wasn't going to have a great life in eternity. The man's reaction tells was what his attitude was. Look at verse 22, Mark chapter 12. Verse 22, he loved his stuff more than he cared about God, more than he cared about heaven. In effect, he had his fingers in his ears at that point La, 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 la. He didn't want to hear what Jesus had to say from that moment on. If stuff stands between you and heaven, Jesus is saying, get rid of your stuff. The only way that God will continue to bless you is if you use what he provides to glorify him. Don't have the attitude of the rich, young ruler. But now go back to John chapter 12 where Reggie read for us a moment ago and look at verses 3, 4, 5, and 6 again. Some of us might have the attitude that Judas had. You remember Judas? One of the 12. Judas Iscariot. One of Jesus' own disciples on his way to becoming an apostle. One that Jesus sent out who was able to heal the sick and, and so forth. You look at John chapter 12, verses 3, 4, 5, and 6, and that tells us something else about him. Get down here. Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii? Now, 300 denarii, 300 pence, the King James Version says. That's almost a year's wages. Can you imagine spending almost a year's wages on perfume? Now this is a little beyond perfume. There are some scholars who, who suggest that, that this, this alabaster container that had this oil of spikenard in it was actually something akin to a burial policy. That it was something that would be purchased against the day that you would die and it would be carefully saved and preserved so that when you died, your corpse 
could be anointed with it before you were buried. But still, imagine spending nearly a year's wages on this. And Simon says, why wasn't it sold for cash? And the cash given to the poor. But then John goes on by inspiration and tells us a little bit more about Simon. No, it was Judas, rather. Where did I get Simon? Judas. He says he didn't care anything about the poor. He was a thief, verse 6. And he was the one that had the money bag. He was the treasurer for the apostles, for the disciples. And the New King James Version says he used to take what was in it. He kind of had his hand in the till. When everybody else had to go without meat, he didn't, that kind of thing. No doubt Judas was a man who had a talent for bookkeeping. Maybe that's why he was the treasurer. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, Peter tells us, Be sober, be, be vigilant, your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion walks about seeking whom he may devour. You know, the fact of the matter is that Satan uses, tries to find things that are, are natural points of temptation for us, natural points of weakness. Maybe this was a natural weak spot for Judas Iscariot. He was good with numbers, good with money. It was a temptation for him. What did he see here in John chapter 12? An extravagant act of love and generosity. But how did he see it? It was a waste in his view. A wasted opportunity for him to steal. Somebody did an end run around him and didn't even know it. Mm, I could have had a year's wages or most of it. Like Judas what we see in any given situation depends on the condition of our own hearts. You know, if I like somebody, it's really hard for me to admit that person's faults. I like my wife. She doesn't have a fault one. I'm serious. But if I don't like a person, it's really hard sometimes to accept that there could be anything good or decent about that person are you like that <laughs> most of us are to some degree Judas didn't care about the poor that's not why he said what he said he cared about missing a shot at 300 denarii are you somebody that has zero interest in anything that's not your idea or your pet project if it doesn't start with you you don't care about it have you ever tried to work with somebody or, or, or deal with somebody where you knew to get anything done you had to convince them that this was not just a good idea but that it was their idea in order for it to to happen that was Judas if all I can do is criticize any activity that's not my idea or if I object to anything that requires us to spend money and trust God to provide it in the church what does that say about me over in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8 the prophet of God asked will a man rob God will a man rob God that that's just that's that's Stunning to think about it that way, isn't it? God knows everything. Will a man rob God? But Judas shows us that sometimes the answer is yes. He would have if he could have. It's interesting that Jesus taught more about this subject of giving than he did about baptism. He taught more about this subject of giving than he did about repentance. He taught more about this in many ways than he did about the church. And I pray that nobody here has the attitude of Judas. Don't let yourself have an attitude of, of greed like he did. But then I hope, attitude number three, that none of us has the attitude of Ananias and Sapphira. 
Mr. and Mrs. Pinocchio. Everything about them sounds good. You look at Acts chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. A certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Nothing wrong there. They sold a, a, a property or something, and, and they gave part of what they made to the church. That's great. There are folks here who have done that. Good for you. But looks can be deceiving. And if you just keep reading, you get down to verse 3. And there, by inspiration, Dr. Luke shows us that that's exactly what was wrong with this situation. Looks can be deceiving. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back a part of the price of the land for yourself? Now make no mistake. The issue here was not the money that they gave. The issue here, verses 8 and 9, was the lie that they told. And what was the lie that they told? From the context, it's obvious. The lie that they told is, we sold it and we gave everything to the church. When they didn't. What were they trying to do? In a perverted way, they were trying to follow the example of Joseph, or Barnabas, as we know him, back in chapter 4, verses 36 and 37. Ananias and Sapphira saw what he had done, and they wanted credit for something that they didn't do. They wanted everybody to think that they did what he did. And it's no different than what we sometimes do. Oh, hey, have you heard there's going to be a, a special gathering for for this uh, benevolent work or for this missionary effort or, or, or for this need. You know, we're going we're gonna to put down, uh, we're going to put a new roof on the building or, or new, new pavement in the parking lot or, or we're going to get all new pews or something and we're going to take up a special offering on such and such a day for it. Oh, I want to be a part of that. That's great. We're going to build that up, build that up. And in the meantime, what are some of us doing? We're holding back, holding back, holding back, holding back what we'd normally give so that on that day we can put it all to that. Folks, there's nothing special about that. Except that we're not following through when we could. A person with a dishonest attitude of this couple is somebody who's lying to him or herself, not to God. I hope none of us has that kind of an attitude. But I do hope that all of us have the attitude of Barnabas. See, we mentioned him a minute ago. Just back up in Acts from chapter 5 to chapter 4 and look at the last couple of verses, 36 and 37 in chapter 4. And we read about Barnabas in Acts chapter 11, verse 24 also, where Dr. Luke tells us he was a good man. He was a man who was full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith and a great many people were added to the Lord because of what he was doing. You see, Barnabas was a, was a pace setter among the saints and he was a man with, with a heart as big as it could be. And he didn't just have a big heart, he had a happy heart too. Why did he make such a sacrifice? You look back at chapter 4, 36 and 37, he had a field and he sold it and he brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Well, you look at the larger context and, and guess what? Go back to Acts chapter 2. What were some of the Christians doing in Acts chapter 2? Same thing. Selling possessions so that the brethren would have what was needed so that the work of the kingdom could go forward. He was following the example of the very first Christians in chapter 2, verses 44 and 45. He was following the example of others in his own situation, according to verses 34 and 35, right here in Acts chapter 4. There was not anyone among them who lacked. All who were possessors of lands or houses sold them, brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. Why was Barnabas singled out? Maybe it was the size of the gift. 
that brought his name to the fore? I don't know. But clearly, his attitude was good and his heart was generous. He saw an opportunity and he rejoiced that he had a way to, to take advantage of it. Can you imagine him complaining about the church's needs? Joseph, Barnabas. Oh. They're asking for money again. Those apostles just never stop. Can you imagine him saying something like that? Can you even imagine him thinking that? I believe that every time he heard any, any, any word about opportunity and giving and ability, he didn't just smile. He looked for some way that he could give even more. May God bless us to have hearts and attitudes like Barnabas. No wonder they called him the son of encouragement. That's what Barnabas means. Son of encouragement. I pray that more and more and more and more of us will have the attitude of the, the little widow that we read about in Mark chapter 12. There in verses 42 and 43 and 44, what would you do if you truly had to lay your gift at the altar, so to speak, where everybody could see it? What would you do? Would you be happy to do that or would you be embarrassed? Would you feel ashamed by what you give? Would you be embarrassed for others to see? Well, I know what he does for a living. Man, that guy's got, that guy works for Delta. That guy's a, he's a, a bank vice president. That guy's, a, he's, he's in the medical field. That, that guy's a, he's got a good income and that's all he gives. Would you be embarrassed? Or would you be comfortable with folks knowing if you're giving liberally like the Macedonians that you read about in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 2, you would rejoice in what you're able to give, what you're able to do. That little widow in Mark chapter 12 was not ashamed. She, had, she didn't even have lunch money. You know, I remember when I could eat in Taco Bell for $2 and a quarter and get a penny back. And I wasn't in high school. I was grown and married and had kids. And it wasn't just one taco. But you know, nowadays, you go in to buy lunch, and you can't buy lunch with a $5 bill most places, can you? I'm not even sure you can buy lunch with a $5 bill in the school cafeteria anymore. This little lady didn't even have lunch money but she gave what she had. She wasn't ashamed. Brothers and sisters, I want us to think and to truly consider whether what we give is merely a donation or it's genuinely a sacrifice. Folks, this congregation, this body has the ability to fund any good work we have the faith to take on. We can do it. If everyone who gives in this congregation increased our offering by $1 a week, you know, that'd be an extra $6,500 a year we could put to something. Make that $10 a week and it'd be $65,000 a year extra. Brother V.P. Black who preached on this subject often and is well known for it, used to make the observation, when I look at our well-dressed congregation, I wonder, where are the poor folks? But then I look in the offering plate and I wonder, where are the rich folks? May God bless us to be like that little widow who truly understood what it means to have a heart that's willing to trust God. Let's have the attitude of King David who shows his attitude in giving by his actions. After his mistake in 2 Samuel chapter 24 of counting the people, taking a census that he shouldn't have taken, David repented and he offered sacrifices to atone for his sin. Arona offered David his land, 
and his oxen and his plow and his cart and everything as a sacrifice for free. Take it, take it, my Lord King. And look at David's attitude in verse 24. I will not offer to the Lord what costs me nothing. I will pay you for it. Like the widow woman. That ancient king understood the concept of sacrifice. God doesn't deserve and he doesn't want my leftovers. He doesn't need them. If we give to God, if what we give him isn't enough for us to feel it, it's not really a sacrifice. May God help us all to learn to give like David did, digging deep so that we feel the cost of our offerings, the true cost of our offerings to God. These six Bible attitudes that we've been looking at, materialism, greed, dishonesty, encouragement, trust, and sacrifice, those are all biblical attitudes, attitudes that are portrayed in the Bible about this subject which one of them describes you which one describes you and what do you need to do with it today I pray brethren I really do that we grow we improve that we become stronger in this grace also this is something we have the ability to do this is something that we can all participate in that will benefit and bless not just us but eternity which attitude is yours The Lord wants your heart. He always has. He will as long as time stands. He wants you to commit your way to Him. But if you're not in His kingdom, if you're not in His family, if you're not in His body, if you're not in His church, you haven't taken the first steps that you need to, the first steps in faith, so that you can be added by the Lord to His kingdom. And your kindness and your goodness and your generosity by themselves, they're not going to get you there. You need to follow the biblical plan. You need to believe that Jesus Christ is the living Son of God. You need to repent of your sins. And we all sin. Romans chapter 3 makes that plain. You need to publicly admit your faith, confess your faith in Jesus Christ as the living Son of the living God and be baptized into Christ. Friends, we're not asking you to join our church. We don't have one. We're asking you to do what the Bible says, to be added by him to his church so that you can eternity. That's the goal. And then go on and live faithfully from here till eternity in this world. For those who are already in the body, if you've strayed, if you've sinned, you know you need to make that right and there's no better time than right now. If you're simply struggling with difficulty or desire or challenge or temptation, you don't have to do that alone. You have brothers and sisters who will help you if you will let them. If we can pray together, if we can go to God's throne on your behalf, all you have to do is ask. And you have an opportunity now. We want you to know if you're visiting with us, if you're members of the Lord's body, it's a convenient moment. If you'd like to be a part of the congregation here to express that desire, and you can talk to one of our elders about that. But if the gospel invitation applies to you, we want to encourage you right now, give yourself wholeheartedly to the Lord. While we stand, as Coney leads us while we sing.
sister Renee Maddox has been going through a difficult period in her life. Uh, she tried to help some people out and in our day and time and in our society, when you try to help people sometimes, it backfires on you. And it begins to make you where you look at things just a little bit di more different than you used to. It sounds good, but sometimes you have to do what's best for you and yours. Just like the attitudes that were presented today. What's your attitude? Sister Maddox says, I would like to thank the church for the helping me through this difficult time and opportunity. She, appreciate, she appreciates this opportunity that the Lord in, has presented her with and given her a time to reflect and recommit herself and to grow spiritually. And she asked for our prayers. She's fixing to go to court this week and so we will pray that the court will look favorably upon her. Like we said, she tried to help. It was viewed as something completely and totally different. And uh, so often in that regard, she, it seems like that she was the loser, but in all actuality, she was the winner because you grew from it, didn't you? Okay. Let us bow and pray. Righteous and holy Father and God, who art in heaven, it is with eternal thanksgiving, Father, that we can come unto you, thou who art the giver of life and all that we have and all that we enjoy, Father. Father, we thank you for the church that your Son and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, purchased with his precious blood. That eternal sacrifice, Father, that we desire to be cleansed with all the time, Father, standing in a good manner with you and with those of the household of faith. Father, we pray that you will accept our thanksgiving for Sister Renee that she has used this opportunity to see the need that we all have to be faithful, to come to you, to cast our cares and burdens upon you all the time. Bless her now, Father, as she goes through this uh, court uh, this week. We pray that you will be with her and that you will be with the decisions that are made that will be favorable for her, Father. Please forgive us of our sin, Father, as we repent of them, for we confess that we're weak and sinful. It's in Jesus Christ's holy and righteous and precious name that we pray. Amen. Several things to think about as we dismiss this morning. Tonight is our teen sing, our first teen sing. We're going to start this this year, one a month. Tonight is the first, so this is for our 6th through 12th graders, middle and high schoolers. We're going to go to the home of uh, Jim and Susan Pelfrey, and we're going to leave. As soon as worship's done tonight, we'll just not take our time, but um, head towards the bus, and we'll head towards uh, the Pelfrey's house. Of course, give them time to get there, and we'll enjoy teen sing tonight this is something i grew up doing we're going to start it here uh our youth they love to sing and so we're going to enjoy uh teen sing tonight at the pelfries now because this is our first one of the year and at fayetteville i'm aiming to be back at 8 30 i i don't know how it's going to go exactly this is kind of our trial run uh so i'm going to aim for 8 30 if anything changes i do apologize um but let us kind of get into the routine of doing this uh, before we know exactly how it's going to go. But 8.30 is the goal to be back tonight, to be picked up. Uh, we know that it is a school night. 
January 18th, Silver Wings Organization Dinner at 6 p.m. January 20th, next Sunday, after AM worship, there will be a potluck to uh, say goodbye to Annette Benefield, who is leaving us. She's moving down to Florida. We love her, and we do wish her well as she moved. Uh, moves. Now, on the youth calendar, if you haven't gotten one yet, they're bright blue in the back on one of the tables. Uh, grab one of those. On that calendar on January 20th, so this coming Sunday, there is a parents meeting scheduled for 3.30, uh, but there's so much going on that day, that time or the day might change. I'll let you know that tomorrow. I want to have a good day that I can meet with my parents just to kind of go over things with you, hear back from you. Uh, I think it'd just be a good thing to have a, a meeting with you uh, to, to do some things with the youth group. So let me get back to you on the change, if it changes, for that parent meeting this coming Sunday. February 3rd, there is a bridal shower for Kristen Nash. I don't see a time in the bulletin, but that's February 3rd. Kristen and I are registered at uh, Target, Bed Bath & Beyond, and Amazon. February 9th is our annual Ladies' Day. Ladies, please plan to attend that and make that great in the bulletin, all are invited to the wedding of Kristen Nash and one lucky guy named David Gulledge. Uh, we want you to know that you're all welcome. All the members here, we understand that if you have something else that day and you can't make it, we understand that. But we want you to come and we want you to know that you're welcome, but we do need to know if you're coming. We need to know that by uh, January 20th. Please RSVP. We have RSV, RSV cards you can mail in or you can do it on a website and that information is in the bulletin all have been registered for CYC if you've signed up you are registered uh, you should know how much it is per person that money will need to be uh, given to the congregation here to the church um, by February 10th please have that paid by February 10th Yesterday was a great day. We fed the homeless. I want to read this given by Sally. She said, yesterday we gave out 165 meals in three different locations. Also given were 25 plus coats, 250 pairs of socks, 25 pairs of gloves, uh, 20 scarves, and other miscellaneous items. Thanks to all who gave these items, those who came and helped, packaged these items, separate these items, and those who went with us and helped hand it out. It was a successful day, and the love of Jesus was shown to many people. A lot of uh, things coming up, a lot of events. Uh, I want to say this, that we are trying to make a difference in the world, but we can't make a difference in the world if we can't first make a difference in you. And so these events are scheduled, planned, and organized to help you in your Christian life, and so I hope that you'll take uh, advantage of them and plan to attend all these events that we have coming up. Other than that, I don't have any other announcements. Dave for that lesson. I believe that's the first time I've ever seen one with emojis on the PowerPoint. Uh, as you've noticed, we've had several lessons uh, at the request of the elders on this same subject over the past few weeks. Um, it is the beginning of a year. We know that 2018 was great for many of us. We've had our ups and downs, but 2019 looks even better. So as we make preparations for that, your elders uh, have spent a number of hours already in considering the budget. And this is based on a number of things. It's based on historical data, what we have done in the past. Uh, it's also based on the input of your deacons who have submitted uh, ideas and, and costs for the projects and the, uh, the growth of their areas of responsibility. 
And as we do this, tomorrow night, the, the elders will be putting the finishing touches on that, so we would ask that your prayers that we make the right decisions, uh, understanding that that budget is based on that historical data, but we add to that a challenge for each and every one of us, and then we add to that faith. So please look forward to that coming in the very near future. Thank you for your presence this morning. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for everything that you give us, the, the many blessings that you shower down upon us, the, the ups and downs of life as we live on this earth. We, we enjoy times of greatness and we struggle at times. We pray that you would be with us when we, when we need you the most as we know that you are. Help us to seek your guidance and focus on your will. We understand, Heavenly Father, that if we have you at the center of our lives, then everything else seems to fall in place and that we live a happy life here. But more importantly, we have the promise that you've given us for that life after this life is over and that's made possible through the sacrifice that you gave through your Son. And it's in his name we ask this prayer. Amen.